I really, really believe that in order to have a profitable, predictable and repeatable business, you need a sales engine in your business. So the profitable piece is an offer, having a really good offer. You know, a great funnel can't fix a bad offer. So that is the absolute starting point is what makes your offer irresistible. Welcome back to the Creators Playbook Podcast. In today's show, we're speaking to the one and only Natalie Ellis, who is the founder and CEO of Boss Babe, which is the largest online membership for female entrepreneurs in the world. To date, Natalie has built an online audience of over 4 million people and has generated over eight figures of revenue through social media. But on top of all of this, Natalie is a prolific angel investor in some of your favorite female-owned brands. And she's served over 100,000 students across her different courses and membership programs. In this conversation, we're going to dive deep into the playbook Natalie used to build her online empire so that you can do the same. So with that being said, grab a pen and paper, kick back and let's get into the show. Welcome to the show, Natalie. How are you doing today? Good. Thank you for having me. Of course. Yeah. Thank you for your time. Um, I guess to sort of kick things off, I wanted to do something a little bit different and maybe just dive a little bit deeper um, into like a rapid fire test just to sort of warm us up and just get the conversation flowing. So is that cool with you? Let's do it. Okay, cool. So these would just be like one word answers. You don't need to dive deep, but um, let's kick things off. So firstly, TikToks or Reels? Reels. Netflix or YouTube? Netflix. Tea or coffee? Coffee. Are you more of an introvert or an extrovert? Introvert. So does that mean you prefer a night in or a night out? In. What was a harder experience, building your first seven-figure business or volunteering in the jungle of Thailand for six weeks? Mm, The jungle. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, What's more important in business, book smarts or street smarts? Street smarts. What was a cooler experience, selling a product to Richard Branson or getting a hug from Russell Brand? Mm, Selling a product to Richard Branson. (laughs) Cool. Uh, Courses, coaching or memberships? Memberships. I thought you'd say that. So (laughs) I guess that wraps up that wraps up the rapid fire. But continuing on the topic of memberships, um, you've been able to build the biggest online membership for female business owners. So for this conversation, I'd love to deconstruct the playbook you followed to achieve this massive success. Um, So are you able to take me back to when you first got the idea about Boss Babe? And then can you walk me through how you took that idea and turned it into a seven figure business? Yeah, so my first company was a supplement company. And through doing that, I learned a lot. But more specifically, I realized that it was a really lonely journey. And there wasn't tons of resources out there for women who were starting businesses with no experience and I started to really crave that kind of community that connection and access to other women who'd been there and done it not so far ahead in their journey that I wouldn't be able to relate to anything or apply anything but real tactical advice from women who were out there doing it so it was through building my first business that I actually got the idea for boss babe and and our membership the society um And so I always think, you know, my first business was really just a big stepping stone into what Boss Babe unfolded itself into. But I created my membership. It was our first product. I created that really selfishly because I wanted the community and I wanted to learn from other women. I thought, well, if there's more of us in the group, those women will be more inclined to say yes to support us. Yeah, awesome. So were you always entrepreneurial growing up? Like you said, you had another business before that. Like, did you ever have random jobs or anything like that or was it always something that you wanted to have your own business I've always been really entrepreneurial um I I did have random jobs to support myself through school and university but always been really entrepreneurial in fact part so my degree was a four-year degree and one of the years the third year you were supposed to work in industry and so you were meant to graduate with a year worth of experience in industry and we had like a list of careers uh, like jobs we could apply to for that one year of industry that was like approved for the degree and I end up getting an, a, mar- a marketing assistant position at a law firm and that was what I was planning to do for the 12 months to get the credits and I thought okay that's probably the best one for me I love marketing and I lasted I think eight weeks and I couldn't do it anymore that corporate life just wasn't for me 
And I actually went back to, I had an entrepreneurial lecturer who she came in and was teaching entrepreneurship. She had her own business. And I went to her and I said, look, I can't do this. Please, can you help me petition to my university to let me go into your business and learn the ropes of entrepreneurship? And I feel like we should, this should be a thing. Like I shouldn't have to work in corporate to get my degree. And we had to petition so hard and put forward so much of a case to allow me to do that and let it count towards my degree and I got paid so much less I mean barely enough to even cover expenses but it was so worth it to me to and I I ended up within three months leaving that and starting this other thing even just in my year off so yes I've always been very entrepreneurial I don't think I would survive in corporate it's just not my thing (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> where do you think that comes from that entrepreneurial spirit Were like were your parents like that were your friends like that or was it just you no my parents weren't like that but I grew up I had a really turbulent childhood and I grew up seeing people around me have zero freedom you know we were really below the poverty line to be quite honest with you and it was quite challenging and I saw a lot of just lack of freedom and I always knew I wanted something different for myself and the way that I stumbled upon even the word entrepreneurship was it was a careers day. I was 14. I actually moved out of home when I was 13 and with my grandparents and I was 14 on careers day and the whole day was unfolding. You know, there was uh, physical therapists, teachers, doctors, and all of it coming in, um, showing their careers and kind of explaining to us all of our options. And I remember the whole day I was so bored thinking none of this is for me and none of this is going to get me the freedom that I'm looking for. And I remember it was the last session in careers day and we all you know get into the hall to sit down I'm exhausted by this point I'm like just get me home this is the most boring day ever and I hear the presenter coming in for that session she walks in she has these high heels on I hear the her heels across the hall and then she puts the most beautiful handbag down I've ever seen it was a mulberry base water if anyone listening remembers the mulberry base water I was like okay I'm listening whatever she's got to say I'm interested And she actually started telling a story of how she was like, I was on the stairs crying into a glass of wine. And I thought, okay, well, that sounds a little bit like my house. Um, Tell me more. And she ended up going into this whole story, how she went through a messy divorce and ended up deciding to set up her own business and create a freedom very different to what she'd, a freedom in a future very different to what she had in the past. And she ended up setting her own company up and talked about entrepreneurship. And I remember just, seeing my mom in a lot of her story I remember really resonating with so much of what she shared I remember the handbag and I remember thinking okay entrepreneurship I think that's for me and it was really that session it clicked for me that yeah that's the thing that actually resonates with me is the idea of having my own business and so although I was young obviously at 14 I didn't go and set up a company it was just always in my head that I wanted to set up a business yeah awesome yeah so go like after that sort of time frame were you like looking up to other entrepreneurs like what what type of I guess content or like what were you doing to sort of like take those next steps to actually becoming an entrepreneur or even starting to think differently well I love to read biographies from other entrepreneurs and I just got really really interested in what it looked like to have your own business and what kind of options you would have Um, So I was really, really interested in that. I decided to go to business school and all the way through it, I kept choosing the most entrepreneurial path that I could to just soak up and learn everything I could about entrepreneurship because it wasn't like I had this big business idea and that's what I why I want to go and start a business I just knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur and I thought okay while I'm young let me soak up all the information I can about it with the hope of stumbling upon an idea that would actually work yeah awesome that's that's beautiful yeah that sounds great so I guess moving on from there then I know your your sort of story is a lot to do with Instagram and starting to build your brand there like what made you decide to start creating content on Instagram and then how did you sort of take that idea to then build Boss Babe to what it is today I just kept seeing this movement on Instagram of people creating content and it going viral and getting followers. And I thought that to me feels like the easiest way to market a business is to grow an audience like that where you can monetize. I never from the beginning was interested in being an influencer. I never wanted to be famous. You know, I didn't care whether my face was on it or not. I just thought I have no marketing budget at all. A really great way of building an audience would be to be building on Instagram. And I decided to pick that platform because YouTube felt really confusing to me. I didn't know how to record videos. I didn't necessarily want to learn to record videos. Um, 
and you know TikTok none of that existed Twitter was out there but I thought Instagram is a really visual platform I'm really creative and I just thought I think I can do this if I really study it, I think I can do this and I started really studying what makes a post go viral how do you build a community like I got really obsessed with that and I started to see traction and I thought, yeah, I'm going to double down here. I, I didn't get distracted with all the platforms, even though people kept telling me I was leaving money on the table. I thought, no, if I master this and I really build a playbook around this, I can grow something incredible. And I started seeing a lot of traction there. Yeah, awesome. I feel like after the pandemic, the word community has sort of become a little bit of a buzzword. Like a lot of people just throw it around. People think like, just because I have followers, I have a community and things like that. So I wanted to ask you like, what... What is your definition of a community? You know, is it self-sustaining? Is it all about you as the leader? Is that why they're there to just hear from you and talk to you? Or are they there for each other? Is it self-sustaining? Do they engage with each other outside of you? Are there common values and goals that they share? What do they rally around? What do they believe in? Um, I really don't think a community is about a certain person or a certain brand. I think they can be the common denominator and the reason that the community get together, but they aren't the reason this community stays together. Yeah. I remember watching a video about, I think it was Greg Eisenberg, where he talks about like this tribe framework uh, when he tests tests um, communities, which I thought was really cool, like togetherness, rituals, member identity, belonging, and then do they engage with each other as well? Um, do you agree like that, that sort of framework is something that you would you would use as like a test to see if you do have a community? Yeah, 100%. I think Greg really is one of the best thinkers out there when it comes to understanding and building community. Um, I think his frameworks are really, really correct with that. You can't just build a following and slap the word community on it that's not a community like just because they follow they the thing they have in common is that they all follow you it doesn't make it a community yeah agreed yeah i think yeah i think people get it mixed up with followers and then the community thing but yeah. um how important is culture and community and how can you how can you build that yeah i see the culture as the heartbeat of the community you know what is it centered around how do people behave how do people interact with each other it's almost like the operating system the rule book of how it all works and i think being really intentional about that's important i will say that's something we've done at boss babe is when you're in our community you know you're joining a place that is incredibly supportive and the women in there are really kind to each other and we've instilled that from the get-go. We, you know, proactively would tell people that is how the community is. And so they can self-select, do they want to be in or do they not? And we're very, very quick to nip any behavior that's not that in the bud and just not allow it. And I think that's yeah. really important. I think you have to know what you stand for and hold that strongly. Yes, of course, it's great to have three, free thinking and conversation and things in community. But if your community is based around supporting women, if there are people in there that are unsupportive rude you know there's just not a place for them and they're not in the right place and so we will very quickly let them know if that's not the right place for them yeah agreed um today how many members are uh, in the boss babe community i mean as a whole not necessarily paying members but as a whole in the community like 4.5 million crazy yeah so like yeah. what was sort of the first sort of steps to building that like obviously you started building the instagram and creating the content and stuff like that and just speaking directly to them but how did you sort of go from instagram to then converting them into something that's a little bit more tangible like an actual place where they can all come together and things like that yeah at first it was short form content that would bring people in that was instagram so a lot of viral short form content that would actually bring people into the brand into knowing about boss babe being able to self-select am i a boss babe am i not a boss babe then we thought about bringing people onto our email list that was a long form content platform where i could deliver value to people and start to really show them what we were about what we stood for and just give that value and then we launched a podcast so it was like in terms of content it was a succession it was nothing it was none of this all at the beginning it was very much just how do I continue engaging more how do I continue to build that relationship with my community taking it a step further each time and then in terms of monetizing our first product was our membership and that was great for community because we really got to say what it was who it's for and what the rules are that we play by and at the beginning you know we had this online platform and it was a Facebook group and that's all we had um 
but it was a really great way to get people interacting. We would do Zoom calls together and introduce each other. And one thing I really remember from the get-go is I don't necessarily want them to think of me when they think of the membership. I want them to think of another woman that they've met through the membership. That would be success to me. That would be community. So yeah, we had the two paths. We had short form continuously going into long form and more and more value. And then we had on ter- in terms of monetization memberships, then we started bringing in uh, courses, additional coaching calls, more of a higher touch. So both sides of it grew together. And I was very intentional about that because again, I was not just trying to build an Instagram page. I was not just trying to build a podcast. I was trying to build a business. And so having the monetization run in parallel with the audience growth has always been really important to me. I mean, in fact, going back to the beginning of the business, I would always set goals in two categories every single year, audience growth goals and revenue growth goals. And I always said, hey, as the audience grows, the revenue should grow. And if it's not, if we're not seeing that, we're not doing it right. We're not just trying to gain followers for the sake of gaining followers. We're not just going to make something go viral for the sake of getting eyeballs. We want to grow community. We want to grow business. And even now to this day, when I look at my annual goal setting I look at my revenue goals and my community goals and I want to ensure both of them are growing how important is that like I know um even just personally for me like I've had videos go viral on say Instagram like millions of views but then they never really converted into actual core sales or coaching or anything that is but then I'd have like a video that's maybe 5,000 views but it's super targeted to my target customer and then that brings me you know three four clients Like how important is it for content creators to get focused on their goals? Because I think there's a bit of a spray and pray approach. Like I'm just going to post it and just uh, my viral videos are going to bring some type of clients, but it rarely happens that way. So like what, how important is that? Do you reckon? I always say there's three types of content out there. There's content to grow your audience, content to build your brand, content to monetize. So content to grow your audience is that viral style. It's the one that's going to bring the eyeballs in the new followers the content to build your brand is the content that gives value and builds that know, like, and trust factor. And content to monetize is content that you are directly using to monetize. And I think you should base your content mix off of your goals. So if you're in a season where you really want to grow your business and you want to make sure revenue is growing, you would focus more on the revenue side and you would balance that with making sure you're nurturing who's there but monetizing. You might not care about the growth numbers. That might feel like a vanity metric for you. Or you might notice that you've really hit a ceiling when it comes to sales and you need more traffic. And so you're going to alternate between all three of them. So I really think goal setting as a creator is incredibly important because you want to be intentional about your content. And when you're intentional about your content, you know which KPIs to track. Because if you're tracking every single KPI without knowing what's important, you'll find yourself making some decisions that aren't going to get you where you want to go. For example, you know what, when we're in a launch period, I'm not looking at how many followers we're getting or how much of a content reach I'm getting. I'm thinking, am I delivering value? And am I having the people that I know be a great fit and roll in the program? And so I'm not going to look at the growth metrics. Whereas if I'm say pre-launch and I'm wanting to build a launch audience, then I'm not thinking about monetization at all. And I'm thinking about building that launch audience. Yeah. Definitely. Do you like, do you have sort of a recommended maybe distribution layout for someone that's maybe starting out that's trying to build a business, but also trying to grow their account? Um, Like maybe I like how you broke it down into the three styles of content. Like, do you have maybe just like an, an example template that a beginner could follow, like in terms of how many growth pieces of content, how many build content, stuff like that? Yeah. So I would always ask where they're at in their business journey, right? If they said to me, Hey, I'm in my early business journey and I need to make money. I would say, okay, well then probably having a following, growing a following isn't going to be your highest priority. If you need to make money, you need a reliable traffic source that is going to bring consistent income. And really that's probably not going to be growing an audience. When we think about the three ways to build an audience and to drive traffic, you can buy it, you can borrow it, you can build it. Buy it as paid ads, Borrowing it is working with affiliates and building it is building your own audience. Buying and borrowing are very short term, very quick. Building is very long term. And so I would always say to someone who was in the build phase who needs to bring in revenue, 
maybe you should focus 75% of your energy in bringing in that revenue from traffic sources that are quick and that you can actually access. And then 25% of your business strategy is thinking long-term. It's thinking I'm doing things now that I'm going to, like I'm planting the seeds now that I'm going to harvest later. And that's how I think about it because if they're solely relying on growing an audience to make sales, they're going to find that business takes a lot longer and um, they're like feeding the beast of social media. That's one thing Brennan, um, Brennan Bashad says, like you're feeding the beast of social media and you're wondering like why it's not paying out. It's not always the best strategy. So I love to be so clear about that, that it's about your, your audience mix and your content mix within that. Sure. Yeah, no, that's great advice. Um, going just quickly back to the types of content that you use to sort of build your community. You mentioned the short form content, the long form content with the newsletter and maybe YouTube videos and stuff like that. And then the podcast for a beginner starting out that maybe doesn't have the bandwidth to be able to create all those types um, from the get go. Which one would you sort of recommend a beginner start with to start building that maybe foundation of people that could potentially turn into um, community members in the future? I would recommend starting with a short form and a long form. And the reason is I think that's that lends itself to building a business more. So maybe it's you're focused on Instagram, but you're writing a newsletter once a week, twice a month, whatever you can handle. I think that's really important because social media is great, but the audience you build on social media is audience built on borrowed ground. And ultimately a business value is its assets. And so I really believe that from the beginning, you should be thinking about building your own audience, which often would be on something like an email list. So if you have the bandwidth from the get go, I would say do it. In terms of today, like how how much has your community, your paid membership brought in in terms of revenue? I actually don't know the answer to that. I mean, way over 10 million, but I honestly couldn't tell you the exact. Yeah number that's crazy that's a big that's a big number though either way it's great definitely eight (laughs) figures or even more i don't even i don't know exactly but it's a lot eight eight figures that's awesome and when did kajabi come into the picture for you in terms of like building the community and then also scaling it so my kajabi journey had been like in and out i i tell kajabi i didn't marry them till last year so i married them in 2023 so From the beginning of creating courses, I worked with Kajabi. Um, I didn't have my entire business in Kajabi. I had, I was using so many different softwares. Oh my God, the amount I was spending on software, it is insane. Like I'd be embarrassed to show you my QuickBooks, but I was using so many different types of softwares for funnels, for emails, for checkouts, but then I would host my programs in Kajabi. My membership, I actually built custom. Huge mistake. Listen, anyone listening, don't build your membership custom unless... You're literally trying to build a software company. You will end up managing developers and banging your head against brick wall and wondering why on earth you did that. So that was a huge mistake that I didn't correct until last year. So last year I decided, you know what? I'm going to go all in on Kajabi. Like it's always worked for me. I'm going all in. I married them. So last year I actually migrated my entire membership off of my custom platform onto Kajabi. And I spent months making it look like a custom site, which by the way, if anyone wants to see a really well done membership, join ours because it's it looks custom when you log in. Like I'm so proud of how it looks. Um, so we had, we moved the membership on there. We moved all of our funnels onto Kajabi, all of our email sequences onto Kajabi and all of our, now we run all of our checkouts through Kajabi. So we were fully complete with our migration, probably September, I would say of last year. And oh my God, I feel like I'm the best <laughs> Kajabi of like, advocate because it saved me so much money in softwares like it's embarrassing how much I was spending on developers and softwares and this and that it saved me so much money on that but also you know one thing that would happen every time we'd have a launch because we would often do webinar launches to send people into and we would get you know thousands of members each time my checkouts my membership would always crash and it was I was always braced for like a tech headache and being on Kajabi has been awesome because they, the platform scales with us. And I'm not trying to be a software company. I'm trying to live out awesome content. So yeah, big fan over here. You think I got paid to see all of that? I don't, but I just really like it. Oh, uh, well, that's awesome. That's, that sounded very honest as well. So we're happy to hear that. <laughs> Shifting gears slightly, I wanted to maybe step out of just the community focused stuff and just talk a little bit more about the nitty gritty of your business. 
um, the main goal of this sort of section is to just get sort of actionable tips that maybe our listeners can start applying straight after this uh, call. So firstly, I've heard you talk about the three part sales engine that every business needs to have to be successful. And I really love how you've broken it down. So would you be able to first maybe explain that and then maybe help um, our listeners maybe figure out how they can build that for themselves? Yeah, so I really, really believe that in order to have a profitable, predictable and repeatable business, you need a sales engine in your business. So the profitable piece is an offer, having a really good offer. You know, a great funnel can't fix a bad offer. So that is the absolute starting point is what makes your offer irresistible, especially if you're in the education space, because let's be totally honest, there's a lot of competition out there. You know, a lot of people have gotten into this space, especially since COVID. So what makes your offer really irresistible? Then we move into predictable. You need to have a predictable funnel. You know, do you know your numbers? If you put a hundred people in, how many sales do you make? That is your funnel. That's your predictability piece. And then repeatable, that's your traffic. So, you know, it's not a one, like you sold an offer once, great. It doesn't mean you've got a a sustainable business. Can you continue to repeat your results month after month, launch after uh, after launch? And that means having reliable traffic, actually like coming to you on a consistent basis. And I really believe, I, I call it a sales engine, having your offer, your funnel and your traffic all dialed in together. I think that's what builds really sustainable businesses. And often when someone comes to me and says, you know, Natalie, my business isn't working. It's one of three things. It's always one of three things. I'm like, let me look at your offer. Let me look at your funnel. Let me look at your traffic sources. And nine times out of 10, they'll say, oh, I don't, I don't have any traffic sources or, oh, I don't have a funnel or, oh, you know, my offer isn't really selling. Like it's always one of three, sometimes three out of three. Yeah. But when you dial that in, that's that's the system. Like we often think business is this like minefield and it's like this whole cheat code to conquer. It's actually a very simple playbook. And yes, it's there's challenges, of course, with anything there's challenges, but it's a simple playbook. And a lot of people don't run the playbook because they get really distracted by shiny objects, by new offers. You know, they never see that funnel through to completion because they've got a new idea. Um and they need to scratch that itch and they jump ship too quickly or they try something once and it didn't work. So they move on to something else. I think if you run that playbook and you're willing to go the distance with it, that's where you'll get that success from. And a lot of people will say, well, how have you been in business so long? How do you continue to grow no matter, you know, whatever's happening in the economy, all those things. And it's a boring answer. It's I run the playbook, I run a simple playbook and I keep it simple. Yeah, no, definitely. I, I think, yeah, like you said, it's a simple playbook, but maybe it's not easy. Obviously there's challenges along the way, but it's definitely simple. Um, in terms of like the product market fit and the offer, I think that's something that stumps a lot of people. Like I've spoken to a lot of beginner entrepreneurs and like that sort of seems like that's the, maybe the biggest roadblock for people to figure out like, what is that offer for my, for my target customer? And like, how do I get product market fit? So do you have maybe any tactical tips on like how someone can actually find product market fit or find that winning offer? Yeah. And I, and it's simplest form I think product market fit is are people willing to pay you for what you're offering and the way I normally frame at the beginning when we're thinking about coming up with an offer is you know we we buy for two reasons to move away from pain to avoid pain or to gain pleasure right like you buy a diet coke not that I would drink diet coke but you dry it buy a dry diet coke or get a massage because you want that pleasure right or um you might buy a course on how to increase your sales because you're trying to avoid the pain of shutting your business down. Like we make decisions from those two, those two places. And if your offer sits right smack bang in the middle, it's probably not a good offer. It's probably not really solving an actual problem and it might not be a problem someone's willing to pay for. So I think about it quite simply in that respect. And then I really think nothing can replace truly getting out there and talking to your ideal clients. Uh, Hopefully you've got an idea of who your ideal client is and the value you can add to them, but you might not know in what form you could deliver it, what price point would work, what exactly they're looking for. And I really recommend, like if if you had a decent idea of your offer and you're like, okay, I really want to find product market fit. I would reach out to say 20 to 30 of your ideal clients, like go seek them out, find them get them on a call and ultimately pitch them what you do. And if you like every time, like if you get a sale at the end of it, take that as product market fit and ask them what made them want to buy. Um, 
And if you don't continue adjusting, is it the price? Is it the way you frame this? Is it the deliverables? Is it the way you deliver it? Really be fluid with it and, and test and pivot and move. And just because, and I just want to say this really loud. I want people to listen to this. Just because someone is in your DM saying, I would totally buy this if you sold it, doesn't mean you should create it. Listen, a hundred people will say, I would totally pay you that I would pay you if you, if you create this and then you create it and you go to sell it to them and one person buys, right? Just because someone says it doesn't mean that that's, that's great product fit or that's something you should do until someone actually pays you for your product. Don't start to assume you've got product market fit. Um, you know, when we're d- launching a new product, we never get the messaging and the positioning right first time round, And we're constantly adjusting real time. You know, we're looking at how much people are engaging, what kind of questions we're getting, what kind of objections we're getting, what makes people excited, what makes people hesitant. So never expect to get it right, right away, but don't expect to get there without doing the testing. No, I love that. Yeah. I think a lot of people get stumped on like trying to make the perfect ver- version one of their offer where like in in the end they just uh, they're just building something that they think is good but they haven't really validated with the market so i think people just forget that like it's a constant game of iteration i'm sure boss babe the first version of that was completely different to what it is today yeah and i i would say too you know we found product market fit and then the economy changed the world changed people change our audience like everything changes And just because it worked once doesn't mean it's always going to work that way. And we've tweaked, we've pivoted, we've changed the way we deliver things because we want this product to have longevity. And rather than just constantly creating new things and ending up on this hamster wheel, I would just listen and tweak. And that's the power, I think, to having an offer with longevity is, like you said, knowing that it is going to have to change and evolve. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Like come up with new iterations. Love that. Um, moving on. So Kajabi recently came out with a report that reported that 95% of creators online are making less than for, uh, are less, less than six figures, whereas only 5% of creators are making over six and seven figures. And since you fall into that 5%, maybe even the 1% of creators, what do you think the other 95% of creators need to do to start making over six figures? Dial in their sales engine. A hundred percent. It's really going to come down to one of those three things. I can almost guarantee it. If it's not working, it's coming down to one of those three things. Um, and mindset underpins all of it. So that's what I would say. And you know, the six figure mark's great, but not everyone wants that too. And it's also sometimes great just to acknowledge what is it that I'm looking for in my business? Am I looking for a side hustle, something to supplement my income? And I actually really love my job. Am I looking for something to tide me over while I figure out what my thing is? Am I wanting to build a six-figure business? Do I want to build a business with a team? Getting really intentional about what that is. Uh, Because if you're also not intentional about what that is, or maybe deep down you do have a desire, but you're going for the six-figure mark or the seven-figure mark because you think you should, you'll really block yourself subconsciously too. Like Our subconscious is very intelligent. It's going to give us what we want. And if you... Um, aren't a hundred percent sure on what you want to build and why I think that can also trip people up. Yeah. I think that goes back to what we were talking about, like getting clear on the goals before actually, you know, creating the content and going out and doing it. I love, I love how you brought that back. Um, moving on, what do you think are the three key things that helped you achieve your success? I would say number one is mindset. Y'all know as an entrepreneur, you have to be resilient and you have to be resourceful. And you have to continue getting up when things are hard and pivoting and fixing and putting out fires and brushing yourself off and dusting yourself off when things don't go right. And if you don't have that resilience and resourcefulness, you won't last very long in entrepreneurship. So that's the first thing. Like anytime I speak with a successful entrepreneur, that's the thing that I recognize them. I'm like, yeah, you're smart, but that's the thing that got you where you actually are. Like we can all read about this in books of what we need to do. But what separates the people that do it and don't do it? So mindset is an absolutely huge, huge one. Um, Second thing is success leaves clues. So I am just a big follower in other people's footsteps. You know, if I want the kind of success that someone else has already achieved, what have they written? What kind of books can I pick up and read? What courses have they created? How can I learn directly from the source and shortcut their learnings? Um, That's been incredibly, incredibly helpful. The third thing I would say, really, I have been committed to doing few things and doing them well. So 
I just haven't allowed myself to get distracted by all the platforms or all the the new ways of marketing a product or all the new different formats of products you can create. And oh, this would be really great. You should do this for your audience. Like there's always an opportunity. There's always something new. There's always, this is making me tons of money. You should try it in your business. There's always a thing. There's always a shiny object. And I really pride myself on not getting distracted by shiny objects. It's so tempting. We all want to scratch that creative itch. We all want to try Like it's really tempting, especially entrepreneurs. We love going from zero to one, but going from one to 10, that's where the, the challenges come. And so I really try and keep myself focused. And I wouldn't say it's easy, but when I look back at my career, I think, yeah, that's the thing that I, I've done pretty well. Yeah, that was so, something that I noticed when I was doing the research for this. It's like, you're like the queen of just like one thing, staying focused and staying consistent on the, on the one thing. And I'm sure while your business was growing, there was probably so many opportunities and different plays that you could have made. But um, staying focused is, is super impressive in terms of what, you'll be, what you've been able to do. Um, on the other side of that, what are the biggest mistakes you made that others could learn from? The times that I haven't been focused, that's always been one. Whenever I've chased the shiny object, like I know that I should focus out of experience because I know when I haven't focused, it's never been good. Um, you know, and then a, a lot of the things that I've just had to learn as a business owner, you know, leaders with people pleasing qualities probably aren't that effective. And um, that's not a great way to lead. It's not a great place to, to do deals from. You know, I've had a lot of qualities in me that I've just really had to mature in and grow from experience on and get really clear about what's my priority and and why might I be saying yes to things that actually aren't going to move the needle for me. They aren't support of my business. They aren't a great use of my time. Am I saying yes to them just because I don't want to let someone down or, you know, not holding my team accountable because I don't want to have the uncomfortable conversation. Like a lot of that stuff is like the real shit that we have to figure out as leaders. And if you don't do that, you'll end up running into a lot of trouble. And I've been there. I feel like I've made every single mistake in the book. Those ones for sure. I would say are the like the when I think about the big mistakes, I've made a lot of it comes down to that. Yeah, that no, makes sense. Yeah, I've heard like leadership is like having those tough conversations are one of the toughest things that are so CEOs tough. And founders have. Yeah, and just hiring in general, I heard is like another thing that all business owners sort of struggle with, or it's like the biggest bottleneck. Um, but yeah, it's and never it's firing cool fast enough ever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, moving on to the last question in this section. If you were starting from zero today, so that means no Instagram, no Boss Babe brand, but you had all your current skills that you have and the experience that you have, what is the playbook that you'd follow in 2024 to build a seven-figure business? So I actually did do this. So um, I took a leave of absence from my business. I, um, When I had my baby, I took my maternity leave. I came back and I really wasn't aligned with my business. And me and my co-founder just weren't on the same page about where I want to take the business. And I initially decided I would step back and she would run the business. And so when I stepped back, I decided to do something else. I didn't have my audience from Boss Babe. I didn't have any of that stuff. Um, and I focused on a niche, which was entrepreneurial seven to nine figure mothers, because I was like, same problem that I was fixing when I started Boss Babe was I felt lonely. I felt like there were, there weren't, I didn't know women that were in the same position as me. And I, and I just wanted that level of support and community. And I created a mastermind and that turned into the seven figure side hustle. I mean, ultimately I ended up going back into Boss Babe and buying the whole company. And that's like a whole different story. But, um, this, turned into a seven figure side hustle and I didn't lean on Boss Babe's audience at all to build this. And so what I did was I knew my niche it was very specific. It was mothers with young kids under 10 who have seven to nine figure businesses. And I sat and thought about the ideal women I would like in, in it. And I just started doing direct reach out and saying this is what I'm putting together. Would you be interested? And it happened very organically like that because I had a very clear offer, had a very clear funnel. It was direct reach out getting people on calls, accepting them or not. And then I had a traffic source, which was, which was direct reach out, reach out. I ticked all the boxes. Um, and yeah, that in the first year that grew to over seven figures and has continued to grow since then. And it was very much just me solving a really big pain point that I had, which seems to be my, the thing that I do in business is like solve my own problems. Yeah. So the sales engine came in, came in clutch again for this. Uh, you're talking about that C CEO mama. Is that the, yeah. is that the mm -hmm. mastermind? Yeah. yeah. So I guess uh, talking about motherhood, how has 
becoming a mother changed how you do business? Because I recently watched, a, I think it was an interview with Ben Francis, the founder of Gymshark, where he recently became a dad and he was talking about how he ha- he sometimes feels like he's in in between a rock and a hard place where like he wants to build the business, but then he knows he wants to be with his um, child as well. So he's constantly in this like tug of war slightly. Um, do you, do you have a similar experience with that? And like, how has, yeah, how has motherhood changed you? It's changed everything about me for sure. Um, yeah. I mean, it's just changed my priorities. When I talk about things I've learned as a leader, I would say I was blessed with a lot of those lessons in motherhood because I wasn't willing to work the long hours to do other people's jobs for them. You know, I wasn't willing to clean up other people's mess. Um, I wasn't saying yes to opportunities that weren't aligned with my priorities. I just became very laser focused, very discerning, very honest, and was so less willing to take bullshit, quite honestly. Like, I knew my priority was my baby. And if I was spending time away from her, it had to be worth it. And so it resulted in a lot of, you know, crucial conversations and behavior changes and uh, business model structure changes, all of it, because I just know what my priorities are. And, you know, becoming a mother, it's you when you go through pregnancy, you know, not every pregnancy is very straightforward and you have a lot of months where you're feeling really sick and tired and you can't just be staring at your laptop all day. So the changes start well before the baby arrives and I had to adjust how I was working. And then as soon as my baby was here, you know, a lot of women don't even think about the healing that needs to happen postpartum. You jump back into what you've always done and realizing you're just not the same and you have, you have to spend time healing and Uh, there's so many hormonal changes that happen all of it and I really wanted to honor my body in the process that I'd been through I just wasn't willing to you know the way we work quite frankly is very patriarchal it's not necessarily the 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 world of work is not necessarily built for women I mean we see that across the board with even maternity leave and the lack of it this world isn't set up to support mothers in work and ambition and achievement it just isn't And I wasn't willing to play by someone else's rules with that. I knew that what was best for me, best for my baby was that I take rest, that I heal, that I go have spent some time going within and figuring out what was important to me. And I just have no shame admitting that because I think there is a lot of shame put on ambitious mothers of, oh, has your ambition changed? Has it moved as if that's a bad thing? And I think what a beautiful thing that you've gotten even closer to what's important to you Um, and hats off to the women that can make it work or hats off to the women that really truly choose what their soul wants to do, not what society wants them to do. I feel like I could talk about this for so long, but I think it's a really beautiful initiation into figuring out who you really are and what's important to you. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Was that shift sort of difficult for you? Because I'm sure like, you know, growing up and while you're building Boss Babe, you were probably like laser focus on like, I'm trying to make this the biggest thing. And then now you've got this whole other new priority, but like, I'm sure the love and the, the sort of growth mindset that you have around boss babe has, hasn't maybe completely gone. So like, how have you been balancing that? And was it, was it difficult to sort of switch gears? Oh, so hard. I mean, my ambition hasn't gone. It's just changed. It's just different. I still want to achieve things and I still want to go out there and do things in the world and I just have less time to do it or I choose it's not that I have less time I choose to have less time to do it you know today's a perfect example my husband's on a hunting trip my nanny called in sick I had in-person podcasts I have this podcast I have to make it work because I care about showing up like I, I, I could cancel but I care about showing up I care about supporting creators I care about my business and my baby's still also ultimately my priority and so I just ruthlessly prioritize and I make sure that my schedule really supports my priorities and um, I also am better at delegating I'm better at holding people accountable I'm better at asking and receiving help that's exactly what I did today and it was really easy for me to do that whereas you know beforehand like I said I probably wasn't in a uh, great at asking for help because I could do it myself you know I worked every hour God gave me like I just it was very different I was in the hustle season of my life and I'm just not there right now not to say I won't go back there but just this isn't the decade of hustling for me 
Yeah, no, definitely. It seems like, yeah, I'm sure I can even sense the energy around you. It's like you've got like this sort of clearer mindset in terms of like what's important and things like that, which is awesome to see. Um, So I guess with that mindset, what's in store for you and your business in 2024 and then also going on into the future? So many big things. We have a lot of really exciting things planned for Boss Babe. I think the brand is just going to keep getting bigger and bigger and, and serving more and more women. Um, what I'm really excited about right now is we have our membership and I think it's the best in the world for female entrepreneurs. We've also just introduced an incredible accelerator program called Freedom Fast Track, where we actually help you build a sales engine in your business. Because I know that's such a pain point. Our membership's really good for for leaning in at your own pace, but I wanted to build something that was like, okay, eight weeks, let's get in there and do it together. So I'm really, really excited about that. Um, you know, our podcast is amazing, the Bossway podcast. And so I would say that's where a lot of my time goes. But yeah, keep your eyes peeled for next year because I think we're going to be out there in way more of an accessible way than just online education. I really want to get into the hands and minds of so many women that might not even know entrepreneurship is their path or might not even believe that they can do it. So that's that's something I'm planning. No, that's awesome. And just one last question before we wrap things up. Um, I saw an interesting stat on your website that less than 18% of women hit six figures in their business and only 2% reached the seven figure mark. So I wanted to ask um, and get your take on why you think that is and what do you think needs to be done to increase those numbers? You know, what's interesting. I put that copy on my website before I became a mother and in my head, and I will say that a lot of this is my thoughts and I don't know how grounded in reality this is but it's the sense I get from a lot of conversations I have I put that I I saw that stat and I thought that's a real shame maybe it's because women aren't getting invited to the tables where a lot of these conversations are happening or maybe they don't have access to the education that it takes you know we know that women don't get funding at the same level men do but in the journey I've been in the last couple of years I wonder for some women how much of that is intentional how much of that is, you know, I want to build a business that allows me to have the freedom of staying home with my kids or, you know, traveling the world or whatever. Like, I just wonder how much of it is intentional. And I would love to know the answer to that. So maybe if any women are listening who have intentionally built their business in a certain way, maybe let me know, because I know for me, I was always just super ambitious. And I was like, yeah, I want to, I want to play at the same level as men. Like, what's the difference? And I was looking at the funding gaps and I thought, yeah, what a real shame. But as I have entered into the world of motherhood and gotten to know a lot more mothers, I've also had a lot of conversations with women who are saying, you know, where I'm at is good enough for me right now. I want to be focused in different areas. I don't want to be super stressed. I don't want to be working every hour of the day. And like I was talking about earlier, we live in a very patriarchal society. And whether we like it or not, women still run the majority of households. Women and mothers still hold the majority of what's called the mother load in their families. And so is that the reason that they're earning less because they have less attention to be able to give their businesses? I don't know the answer. And maybe that's really controversial. Maybe I'm going to get canceled for saying that, but (laughs) it's definitely, it's something that I'm wondering and I would love to know the answer to. So before canceling me, come and let me know. (laughs) (laughs) Well, perfectly said. Um, Thank you so much for taking the time and giving out all this free game today. I'm sure our listeners have got so much value from this call. Um, if anyone is interested in learning more about you, where can they find more about you? Like where where should they be checking out first? Yeah, thanks for having me. These were really great questions. Um, the Boss Way podcast is a great place. Um, I'm on Instagram at I am Natalie, and then you can also go to bossway.com. Perfect, Natalie. Thank you again for your time. And as always, we will have all the relevant information in the show notes below. So be sure to check that out. And thank you for listening. And we look forward to seeing you next week on the Creators Playbook podcast.